After my grandmother died, I inherited a house, but my relatives got together and wanted to kick me out, so I sued them and I don't think I've ever felt more alone in a crowded room than I did the day of my grandmother's funeral. It was packed with people, cousins, aunts, uncles, neighbors who swore they were her closest friends. But even in that swarm, I felt this gulf, this detachment, as if I were the only one who really understood who she was. For me, Grandma Lillian wasn't just a family member. She was my rock. She raised me, taught me about resilience, compassion, and what it means to truly be there for someone. Losing her felt like losing my foundation. After my parents divorced when I was eight, Lillian stepped in. She made sure I never felt abandoned. In a lot of ways, she was more of a parent than my actual parents were. They were always too busy arguing or caught up in their own lives to pay me much mind. But Lillian? She was the one who stayed up with me when I had nightmares, who showed up at every school event, who spent hours listening to me talk about my dreams my fears, my teenage confusion. So when she passed, it was like the only person who ever truly cared about me was gone. As I stood by the coffin, one last attempt to say goodbye, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I turned to see Aunt Rebecca, her eyes glassy, but her face far too composed. She squeezed my shoulder a little too hard and said, Aaron, dear, it's good to see you holding up so well. You know, she left behind quite a legacy for us to protect. I didn't think much of it at the time. It was a funeral, and people say all sorts of vague things in these moments. But looking back, that was the first sign that things were about to get messy. After the service, everyone went back to Lillian's house. It was a modest, cozy little place with faded wallpaper and the smell of old books. It hadn't changed much in the 20 years I'd known it. As soon as I walked in, memories washed over me the nights we'd spent curled up on the sofa, the countless games of cards at the kitchen table, the shelf of dusty mystery novels she loved. But that comfort didn't last long. My family seemed to have some other plans for the house, ones that didn't include me. The subtle signs started stacking up quickly. Aunt Rebecca and Uncle Mark had taken over the kitchen, not just serving coffee but acting like they already owned the place. Cousin Sarah, who was always more of a background figure in my life, had stationed herself near Grandma's bedroom, keeping people from wandering in. I didn't understand why at first, but when I asked if I could grab something from Grandma's old dresser, Sarah gave me this strange look and said, Not now, Aaron. We need to keep her things organized. For the family. For the family? I tried to brush it off. Maybe it was the grief or the exhaustion, but I wasn't in the mood to start a scene. I went along with it. Even when Uncle Mark started talking about keeping everything in the family and preserving Lillian's legacy. What could that mean? Really? We were her family, her only family. But that night, something started to nag at me, a sense that I wasn't seeing the whole picture. The next morning, I woke up to the sound of furniture moving downstairs. Aunt Rebecca and Uncle Mark were already up, rearranging things. They'd moved Lillian's beloved armchair out of the living room and replaced it with a newer, ugly recliner. I asked them why, and Rebecca said, Oh, honey, that chair is so old. We need to modernize this place a bit if it's going to be a family home. Family home? I repeated, my eyebrows raised. She looked at me, almost patronizingly, and said, Aaron, don't you understand? We have a responsibility to keep this house in good shape. It's our legacy, after all. I wasn't sure what to say, but Lillian left the house to me. I managed, trying to keep my voice steady. It's in her will. Uncle Mark, who'd been listening nearby, piped up. Yes, but that doesn't mean it's only yours, Aaron. We all have a stake in this. It's a family asset. Lillian wouldn't have wanted you to just take it and run off with it. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Run off with it? I'm not planning to sell it or anything. This is my home, too. You all have your own places. Why are you trying to control what happens here? Uncle Mark folded his arms and Aunt Rebecca gave me one of those pitying, infuriating smiles. Aaron, you're young. You may not understand this yet, but family assets need to be handled with care. Lillian would have wanted us to work together to maintain her legacy. I took a breath, struggling to stay calm. I couldn't understand why they were acting like this, why they were suddenly claiming ownership over something that wasn't theirs. It was like they were rewriting history, 
pretending Lillian was some kind of family property they all had rights to. I'd never once seen them step up for her while she was alive. When she was sick, I was the one driving her to appointments, picking up groceries, handling her bills. Now, they wanted to swoop in and preserve her legacy? It was maddening. Things escalated later that day when Cousin Sarah pulled me aside. She was usually the quiet one, so I was surprised when she looked me dead in the eye and said, Aaron, don't you think it's time you started thinking about your family instead of just yourself? What are you talking about? I asked, thrown off balance. Look, we all know how close you were to Grandma Lillian, but that doesn't mean you have the right to keep everything to yourself. We're her family, too. And it's not fair for you to act like this house is yours alone. You didn't even offer to help with the funeral expenses. I stared at her, baffled. Help with funeral expenses? No one even asked me. I would have gladly helped, but no one told me they needed anything. She shrugged, not really meeting my eyes. Well, maybe if you'd been paying attention, you would have noticed. We all pitched in. It's only fair that you contribute your share, too. I didn't know what to say. I felt blindsided. They'd planned this, all of them, carefully orchestrating a way to guilt me into giving up control. And the worst part? They acted like I was in the wrong, like I was the one trying to cut them out of something they had every right to. By the time I went to bed that night, I was drained, furious, and completely at a loss. I tried to remind myself that this was just a misunderstanding, that they couldn't actually take anything away from me. But the nagging fear wouldn't go away. They seemed so sure, so united in their belief that I owed them, that I couldn't just claim what was rightfully mine without a fight. I lay there in the dark, wondering how this had all gone so wrong so fast. The next morning, I returned to my grandmother's house, hoping things would feel different. But as I stepped inside, the atmosphere was even tenser than the day before. It wasn't just grief hanging in the air anymore. There was something darker, like the smell of betrayal waiting to surface. I quickly realized that my family had practically moved in. Aunt Rebecca had draped a garish throw blanket over Lillian's couch, claiming it brightened the room. Uncle Mark was rifling through Lillian's old book collection, stacking them in piles, muttering something about deciding what stays and what goes. And Sarah, who'd always had a knack for managing situations to her advantage, was now talking to a stranger in the dining room. I later found out he was an appraiser. An appraiser? I asked Sarah, struggling to keep my voice steady. Why would we need an appraiser? She turned to me with a look that was almost pitying. Aaron, we're just trying to assess the value of things. We want to make sure everything is handled properly and, you know, evenly distributed. Evenly distributed? I echoed, incredulous. This isn't some estate sale. This is grandma's house, and she left it to me. Yes, technically, she left it to you. She replied with a tight smile. But she also left behind family history, traditions, and memories. We can't just let one person take it all. My heart sank. They were serious about this. In their eyes, they weren't just crashing in on my inheritance. They were entitled to it. They acted as if they'd been the ones by Lillian's side all those years. As if they'd spent nights caring for her, staying up to make sure she was comfortable. The memories, the traditions. Those were all things I'd shared with her. Not them. But none of that seemed to matter. A few hours later, after a tense silence between us, Aunt Rebecca called everyone into the living room, where she seemed poised to give some sort of speech. I could tell she'd been building up to this moment, preparing to drop whatever bombshell she'd concocted in the name of family unity. Aaron, she began, her voice dripping with a mix of forced empathy and authority. We all agree that Lillian's legacy is precious. We know she meant the world to you but she meant the world to all of us as well. That's why we're proposing a plan to keep her house in the family. A joint arrangement, you could say, where we each have a stake in it. I clenched my jaw, already sensing where this was going. A joint arrangement? What does that even mean? It means, Uncle Mark interjected, that we treat this house as a shared family property. We'll all contribute to its upkeep and have equal access. And if we decide to rent it out, the income would be shared fairly among us. I stared at them, dumbfounded. Rent it out? Grandma didn't leave this house to you. She left it to me. I don't want to rent it out. I want to live here. Aunt Rebecca raised an eyebrow, 
her smile icy. Now, Aaron, don't be selfish. This house is more than just yours. It's part of our family history. You don't want to be responsible for breaking that up, do you? Sarah, who'd been quiet until now, chimed in. Honestly, Aaron, we're just trying to keep the family close. This place means something to all of us. Grandma wouldn't have wanted us to fight over it. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. They were twisting everything, making it sound like I was the villain for wanting to honor Lillian's wishes. But I knew my grandmother. She wouldn't have wanted this. Her own family clawing at each other for a piece of her life. Manipulating her memory to justify their greed. Feeling cornered, I took a breath and said, I have a letter from Grandma. She was clear about her wishes. She wanted me to have this house, to keep it as a place for myself. She even said it was because she trusted me to take care of it the way she would have wanted. Uncle Mark's face darkened. Well, that's convenient. But maybe she didn't consider the bigger picture, Aaron. Maybe she didn't anticipate how hard it would be for the rest of us to let go. I shook my head, unable to contain my frustration any longer. You all had your lives. You barely even came around. You were busy with your careers, your travels, whatever else you had going on. But now, suddenly, you care about this house? You're treating it like some investment. Rebecca's expression hardened. Careful, Aaron. We're not the enemy here. We're trying to be reasonable. We're asking you to think about the family as a whole. Lillian would have wanted unity, not division. At that moment, I felt like I was in some kind of alternate reality, one where the people I'd grown up with were strangers. They kept using Lillian's name as if it would somehow sanctify their intentions, twisting her memory into something unrecognizable. The next few days were a blur of arguments, subtle manipulations, and veiled threats. I started feeling like a prisoner in the house. Aunt Rebecca and Uncle Mark were there every day, moving things around, cleaning, talking about repairs and improvements. They were making themselves comfortable, settling in like they'd already claimed the place. I knew they were hoping I'd get so frustrated that I'd leave, that I'd walk away and let them have what they wanted. The breaking point came one evening when I found Sarah and Aunt Rebecca poring over old photos in the living room. They'd started taking pictures off the walls, rearranging the decor, they said. When I asked them to stop, Rebecca sighed and said, Aaron, you're acting like a child. We're just trying to create a more modern feel. Grandma would appreciate it. That's when I snapped. This isn't your house. You don't get to decide what stays and what goes. This was Grandma's space, her memories, her life. I don't want you erasing that. Rebecca scoffed, crossing her arms. And you think you're honoring her memory by refusing to compromise? Do you think she'd want you to push your family away? Sarah joined in, her voice soft but with a sting underneath. Maybe you were closer to her, Aaron, but that doesn't mean you're the only one who loved her. We're trying to keep her legacy alive. We're asking you to consider what's best for all of us. Feeling drained and cornered, I didn't have a response. I left the room and locked myself in Lillian's bedroom, the one place they hadn't invaded yet. I sat on her bed staring at the walls filled with old family photos and knickknacks she'd collected over the years. I could almost feel her presence, like she was there with me, telling me to stand my ground. The next morning, I called a close friend of mine, Jacob. He was a lawyer, someone I trusted to give me honest advice. When I told him about everything that had been happening, he was quiet for a moment, then said, Aaron, it sounds like they're trying to manipulate you into giving up your rights. If you don't set boundaries now, they'll keep pushing. But they're my family, I said, almost pleading. I don't want to end up in some bitter legal battle with them. Jacob's voice softened. I get it. But if they're already treating you this way, do you really think backing down will help? You have every right to protect what Lillian left for you. Sometimes, family isn't as straightforward as we'd like it to be. That conversation stuck with me. I knew Jacob was right. But taking legal action against my own family? It felt like a line I didn't want to cross. Yet as the days passed and their grip on the house grew stronger, I felt my options dwindling. It all came to a head one evening when Aunt Rebecca handed me an envelope. Inside was a bill, a list of all the funeral expenses they'd supposedly covered, along with costs for house maintenance. It totaled thousands of dollars. We thought it'd be fair for you to cover your part, she said. 
her voice almost smug. After all, you're the one inheriting the property. It's only right for you to contribute. I felt a surge of anger rise up in me. I knew what this was. One last attempt to make me feel like I owed them something. Like I didn't deserve what Lillian had left me. They wanted me to feel trapped. To give up and let them take control. In that moment, I made up my mind. I wasn't going to let them steamroll over me. I was done letting them twist Lillian's memory into some kind of weapon. If they wanted a fight, then I'd give them one. The day after Aunt Rebecca handed me that so-called bill, I took a long look at my options and decided that I couldn't sit back anymore. This wasn't just about the house. It was about honoring Lillian's memory and protecting the life she'd entrusted to me. The choice was clear. If they were going to treat me like an outsider, then I'd protect my place in this family the only way I knew how. It was time to take legal action. I called Jacob and told him everything. He listened patiently, without interrupting, as I went through the details, the manipulation, the emotional blackmail, the attempts to guilt me out of my inheritance. When I finished, there was a pause, and then Jacob let out a low whistle. Aaron, this isn't just a family dispute. It sounds like they're actively trying to coerce you into surrendering your legal rights. Hearing it put so plainly, I felt a mix of relief and dread. Relief because finally, someone understood. Dread because this meant I was about to face my family in court. I asked Jacob what my options were, hoping there was a solution that wouldn't completely shatter any chance of reconciliation. But Jacob was realistic. He explained that unless I filed a formal claim to assert my ownership, they would continue pushing, and things could get even worse. Do you have any proof of what your grandmother wanted? Jacob asked. Yes, there's a letter, I said, thinking of the short but meaningful note Lillian had left me a few months before she passed. In it, she had written, This home is yours, Aaron. I know you'll cherish it the way I have. It wasn't part of the will, but it was something personal, something that confirmed she wanted me to have the house. I sent Jacob a copy of the letter, and he said he'd start building a case. A few days later, I received a call from Jacob. He'd taken a deeper look into my family's actions, and what he found surprised both of us. Apparently, this was more than just an inheritance grab. Uncle Mark had a history of financial trouble. He'd borrowed money from Lillian several times over the years, and Jacob's search had uncovered hints of debts Mark hadn't repaid. Rebecca, too had been named in a couple of small claims for loans she defaulted on in the past. It was starting to look like they saw Lillian's house as a way to solve their own financial messes. I felt a mixture of anger and sadness. This wasn't just about family pride or legacy. It was about money. They didn't want to preserve Lillian's memory. They wanted her assets. The next family meeting felt like walking into enemy territory. Aunt Rebecca, Uncle Mark, and Sarah were already there talking in low voices when I walked in. They looked up, their expressions shifting from annoyance to something that almost looked like apprehension. I had no idea how they'd react to the news I was about to deliver, but I knew it was time. I've hired a lawyer, I said, watching as their faces froze. I'm officially filing to confirm my ownership of Grandma's house. Rebecca's face flushed red, and for a moment, she looked like she might explode. A lawyer, she said her voice a mixture of disbelief and outrage. Aaron, you're going to sue your own family? Over what? A misunderstanding? It's not a misunderstanding, I said firmly. This house was left to me. Grandma was clear in her will, and you all know it. But you've been trying to push me out, treating me like I don't belong here. Uncle Mark scoffed, crossing his arms. Come on, Aaron. We're just looking out for what's best for the family. You're the one who's being unreasonable. You're young. You don't understand the value of family unity yet. I held up a hand, refusing to let them twist this anymore. Family unity doesn't mean bullying someone into giving up what's theirs. You've been manipulating me from the moment Grandma passed. I'm done with it. There was a heavy silence as they absorbed my words. Then Sarah, who had been uncharacteristically quiet, stepped forward. Aaron, she said softly. Can we at least talk this over? Do we really need to get lawyers involved? I looked at her, searching her face for any sign of sincerity, but I saw nothing but calculation. Sarah, I've tried talking. I've tried reasoning. But every time I've tried, 
You've made it clear that you're not interested in what I have to say. This isn't about keeping the family together. It's about taking control. Rebecca's expression shifted to one of bitterness. Well, if that's how you want to play it, fine. But don't expect us to sit back and let you walk all over us. Over the next few days, the atmosphere around the house grew even more hostile. My family had taken up permanent residence there, determined to make my life as uncomfortable as possible. They moved my things without asking, took over the kitchen, and even changed the locks on the back door for security reasons. It was like they were trying to erase any trace of me being there, to make me feel like a stranger in my own home. Then came the letters. One after another, formal-looking envelopes arrived in the mail, each one with demands from Rebecca, Mark, and Sarah. They claimed I was mismanaging family assets and undermining family unity, accusing me of everything from greed to betrayal. I took the letters to Jacob, who shook his head in disbelief. This is textbook coercion, he said. They're trying to wear you down, make you doubt yourself. Don't let them. We have enough to take this to court. The final straw came one evening when Sarah cornered me in the hallway, her voice low and urgent. Aaron, listen. We don't have to do this. Let's make a deal. I raised an eyebrow, wary. What kind of deal? Look, Uncle Mark is in a bit of financial trouble. You know that, right? She said, glancing around to make sure we were alone. If you're willing to walk away from the house, we can give you a portion of the money once it's sold. You wouldn't leave empty-handed. I stared at her, the sheer audacity of her proposal making my blood boil. You're asking me to give up my home the place Grandma left to me, so you can bail Uncle Mark out of his own problems? She flinched, just for a second, but then her face hardened. Aaron, it's not just about you. We're a family. Sometimes sacrifices need to be made. I took a deep breath, trying to rein in my anger. And you think that sacrifice should be mine? Why should I have to give up everything when none of you were there for Grandma? I was the one who took care of her, Sarah. Where were you? She looked away, unable to meet my eyes. Fine, she said finally, her voice cold. If that's how you feel, then I guess we'll see you in court. The court date was set, and in the weeks that followed, the house became a battlefield. I barely spoke to my family, and when we did cross paths, they looked at me like I was the enemy. But I couldn't back down now. I knew that if I did, they'd take everything and act like it was some noble sacrifice on my part. I couldn't let them rewrite Lillian's legacy to suit their greed. In preparation for the hearing, Jacob helped me gather evidence. He dug into Uncle Mark's financial records, and we found proof of unpaid debts, loans from Lillian that he'd never bothered to repay. It was clear that Uncle Mark had seen this house as his golden ticket out of financial ruin. Aunt Rebecca, too, had a history of using family as her personal bank. It all pointed to one thing. They wanted the house not to honor Lillian's memory, but to secure their own interests. The night before the hearing, I found myself sitting alone in Lillian's room, surrounded by her things. Her scent still lingered in the air, faint but comforting, like she was there with me. I looked around at the photos on the walls, the knickknacks on her dresser, the worn novels she'd read a hundred times. For the first time in weeks, I felt a sense of peace. This was what I was fighting for. Not the property, not the money, but the life we'd shared here, the love she'd given me. As I sat there, I could almost hear her voice telling me to stand up for myself, to protect what mattered. And for the first time, I knew I was doing the right thing. The morning of the court hearing, I was up before dawn, pacing the house in a state somewhere between anxious and numb. I knew this would be my only chance to finally claim my place in Lillian's legacy to put an end to the nightmare my family had turned this experience into. My stomach was in knots, but there was no turning back. I dressed in a suit that Lillian had once helped me pick out for job interviews, and it somehow felt like a piece of her was with me, supporting me. When Jacob arrived to pick me up, he gave me a reassuring nod, the kind that told me he had my back no matter what. In the courtroom, my family was already seated on the other side of the aisle. Aunt Rebecca sat ramrod straight, her lips pursed, eyes flashing with a kind of bitterness I'd never seen in her before. Uncle Mark looked tense, like he was preparing for a fight. Sarah had that same calculating look she'd given me during her deal proposal, her gaze hard and unfeeling. As I took my place, 
It struck me how far we'd come from the days when we'd all sat around Lillian's dinner table, laughing and swapping stories. Whatever family bond we'd once had was gone, replaced by a cold determination on their part to take what wasn't theirs. The proceedings began, and Jacob laid out our case with a calm confidence that gave me a flicker of hope. He presented the letter Lillian had left for me, her own words affirming that she wanted me to have her house. He spoke about my relationship with Lillian, about the years I'd spent by her side, the nights I'd stayed up worrying about her health. He didn't try to paint me as a hero, just as someone who'd loved his grandmother deeply and had been loved in return. Then, Jacob addressed the financial records. He revealed the unpaid loans that Uncle Mark had taken from Lillian over the years, amounts that hadn't been small or incidental. When he presented the evidence of Mark's financial issues, you could feel the shift in the room. Uncle Mark shifted uncomfortably in his seat, the color draining from his face. Rebecca and Sarah exchanged worried glances, clearly caught off guard by this exposure. Mr. Mark, Jacob said, his voice firm but respectful, isn't it true that you owed Lillian a considerable amount of money at the time of her death, and that she had given you those funds as loans, which were never repaid? Mark stammered, glancing at Rebecca for support. Well, Lillian, she knew I'd pay her back eventually. She was family. She didn't mind helping me out. Helping you out? Jacob repeated. Or was it more that you saw Lillian as a financial safety net, one you never actually intended to repay? And now, you're hoping to use her house to bail yourself out. The courtroom went silent as everyone processed Jacob's words. Uncle Mark's face turned a deep red. His jaw clenched in anger and embarrassment. Meanwhile, Rebecca tried to jump in, saying, Lillian loved Mark. She wouldn't have cared about something as trivial as a few debts. Jacob turned to Rebecca with a look that could slice through steel. Trivial? Mrs. Rebecca, Lillian didn't leave this house to all of you. She entrusted it to her grandson because she believed he would cherish it. Yet, here you are, claiming a right that was never granted to you. And in fact, you're attempting to profit from it, under the guise of family legacy. As the back and forth continued, it was clear that my family hadn't anticipated being held accountable for their actions. They'd expected to come here, to put on a united front, and bully me into giving up. But with every question Jacob asked, every document he presented, their narrative unraveled. They weren't here to honor Lillian. They were here to claim what they thought they were entitled to, regardless of her wishes. Then, something unexpected happened. The judge, who'd been listening attentively to both sides, spoke directly to Sarah. Miss Sarah, earlier, your attorney mentioned that you made attempts to negotiate with Mr. Aaron privately. Could you explain the nature of these negotiations? Sarah looked startled, her gaze shifting between me and her lawyer. She hadn't anticipated this. She fumbled with her words, saying, I well, I offered Aaron a fair settlement. He wouldn't be left empty-handed. We just thought it would be easier for him if he, if he took some money and allowed us to manage the property. It's what we believed Grandma would have wanted. Jacob seized the moment. Easier for him? Or easier for you? And when you say manage, do you mean that you and your family had planned to sell the property? Sarah's face went pale. She stammered, no. No, well, possibly. But it's complicated. We're just trying to look out for the family. Jacob leaned in, his voice firm. Miss Sarah, this isn't complicated. You were asking Aaron to relinquish his rightful inheritance in exchange for a payout, all to benefit your financial interests. And when he refused, you continued to exert pressure, even changing locks and moving belongings to make him feel unwelcome in his own home. Rebecca looked like she was about to explode. This is outrageous, she hissed, but the judge cut her off with a look that silenced her instantly. When it was Uncle Mark's turn to speak, he was visibly rattled stammering through excuses about how they were only trying to preserve family unity. But the more he spoke, the clearer it became that they were grasping at straws, their intentions laid bare. They wanted control, plain and simple. The court recessed briefly, and I walked out of the room, feeling the weight of everything that had just happened. I could hardly believe we'd gotten this far, that I'd stood up to them, held my ground, and finally exposed the truth. Jacob patted me on the shoulder, saying, You did well in there. 
Sometimes the hardest battles are the ones we have to fight with the people closest to us. The next part of the hearing focused on final statements. Jacob summarized everything, reminding the court that Lillian's will and her personal letter left no room for doubt about her intentions. The house was meant for me, her grandson, the one she trusted and loved. My family had twisted her memory to serve their own interests, but at the end of the day, the facts were clear. When the judge returned, she took a long, thoughtful pause before speaking. I held my breath, waiting for the decision that would either free me from this nightmare or plunge me deeper into it. After reviewing the evidence and hearing both sides, the judge began, her voice measured, it is evident that Lillian's wishes were for her grandson Aaron to inherit the property without any conditions or interference from other family members. The attempts to intimidate and coerce him are concerning and reflect poorly on the other parties involved. My heart pounded as her words sank in. This court recognizes Mr. Aaron's sole right to the property in question, as specified in Lillian's will and supported by the additional documentation provided. Mr. Aaron is hereby granted full ownership, and any actions to interfere with his use of the property will be considered in violation of this ruling. I barely heard the rest, my head swimming in relief. I'd won. The house was mine, and they had no claim to it, no power over me anymore. Rebecca, Mark, and Sarah looked shell-shocked, as if they'd just woken up from a dream. The reality of the situation hit them hard. They shuffled out of the courtroom without a word. Their expressions a mix of anger, disbelief, and, maybe, shame. I watched them go, feeling a strange pang of sadness despite everything. They were still my family, but what they'd done had left scars that I wasn't sure could ever heal. Outside, Jacob shook my hand firmly, his smile wide. Aaron, you did it. And more than that, you honored Lillian's memory by standing up for what was right. I nodded, the weight of the moment settling over me. I couldn't have done it without you, Jacob. Thank you for everything. We stood there for a moment, silent in the aftermath of a battle that had finally ended. But as much as I'd gained, I couldn't ignore the emptiness left by what I'd lost. I didn't know what my relationship with my family would look like from here, or if there'd even be one, but I knew that I'd honored Lillian, and that, for now, was enough. When I returned to the house, it felt different, not as a battleground or a prison, but as a home. After the court's decision, I returned to my grandmother's house alone, stepping into a space that finally felt like it belonged to me. The air was different, quieter, somehow without the simmering tension of family members waiting to pounce. As I walked through the rooms, I felt Lillian's presence, a sense of warmth and calm that reminded me why this house had always felt like a sanctuary. For the next few days, I worked to put things back in order. I took down the strange decor Rebecca had imposed, rearranged the furniture to where Lillian had left it, and put her precious things back in their rightful places. I found peace in each small act, each way I could reclaim her memory. It was as if, with each photo hung, each item returned, I was rebuilding a piece of my connection to her. A connection my family had tried so hard to fracture. But while the house felt more like home than it had in weeks, there was still an ache I couldn't ignore. My family had once been my foundation, too, but now they felt like strangers. I knew they resented me, blamed me for tearing apart the family even though it was their greed that had led to the lawsuit. The silence from them was heavy, like a chapter closing in my life, and I wasn't sure if it was for good. One afternoon, I found myself in the attic, sorting through boxes of Lillian's things. Among the dusty keepsakes, I found a small wooden box. Inside were old letters, all addressed to me. I hadn't seen these before, and as I read through them, I realized they were from different stages of my life. Little notes Lillian had written, reminders of her love and encouragement. One letter, dated just a few years ago, stood out. She'd written, Aaron, this house is more than walls and furniture. It's a place of love, a place to grow. I trust you to keep it that way, to fill it with memories and laughter. The words hit me hard, filling me with a new resolve. She'd known exactly what she was entrusting me with and her faith in me was the greatest legacy she could have left. In the following weeks, I began to invite friends over, breathe new life into the home. Jacob came by, too, 
bringing a bottle of wine, and raising a toast to both Lillian and my resilience. It was the first time in a while that the house felt alive again, filled with laughter and warmth. This was how Lillian would have wanted it. Over time, the bitterness faded, replaced by a quiet understanding. My family might never come to terms with the outcome, and maybe we'd never fully reconcile. But I'd done what Lillian wanted. I'd protected her home, and in the process, I'd found my own strength. As I stood by the window one evening, looking out at the familiar view, I felt a peace I hadn't felt since she passed. This house was mine, yes, but it was more than that. It was a symbol of love, a legacy I was determined to honor, for Lillian, for myself, and for whatever future lay ahead.